Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel. Those are words taken from today's communion antiphon for the fourth Sunday of Advent. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Valerian was an emperor of Rome during the third century. He was a nobleman, and he was a leader of the most powerful secular empire in human history. He won many battles, both in the West and in the East, in terms of expanding his kingdom. But on one fateful campaign, Valerian contracted, along with his army, the plague. And they were dangerously vulnerable to the attacks of the Persians. And as a result, the emperor arranged a special meeting with Chapur, the leader of the Persians, in order to negotiate peace, terms of a truce. Unfortunately for Valerian, the emperor, the Persian ruler tricked him and unjustly captured the emperor. Valerian remained in the hands of the Persians from 260 A.D. until his death five years later. And he is the first and only Roman emperor ever to be held a prisoner of war. Far from treating him with dignity and respect befitting his high office, the Persian king Shapur delighted in humiliating him. Valerian was paraded around the Persian Empire in chains. But even worse, Valerian was used as a footstool every time that Shapur needed to mount his horse. And so Valerian was forced to bend low to get down on all fours while Shapur placed his foot upon the neck and back of the emperor as he went up into his saddle. And this humiliating act was performed and repeated dozens of times each week to emphasize to the onlookers that the noble, powerful, and dignified Roman emperor was under the heel of the king of Persia. The details of Valerian's death are both gruesome and humiliating. When Valerian offered Shapur a ransom paid in gold for his release, the Persian leader forced Valerian to literally swallow molten gold. And immediately afterwards, Valerian was flayed alive like a fish. In other words, to complete the degrading treatment, Valerian's body was skinned, tanned, stuffed, and mounted on a wall in Shapur's palace, like a trophy fish, where it remained for generations. Now the image of the Emperor Valerian being under the foot under the heel of Shapur, provides us with a picture of how things were like after the fall of Adam and Eve. Our first parents, our ultimate progenitor, and his wife who became the mother of all the living, our first parents were created perfectly, both naturally speaking and supernaturally speaking. Adam was the Lord of the universe. He was the emperor of all material creation. And his empire was vast and wide, and he would name all those animals, all those things that were subject to him, that were under his feet. And as long as Adam was subject to the Most High God, all things would be subject, would be submissive to him. But then it happened. The original sin of our first parents, the sin of Adam and Eve, and we had the fall of man. And like Valerian, Adam and Eve lost the battle. They fell prey to temptation, and they were captured. From that time onward, Adam and his children came under the foot of that unjust tyrant known as Satan. That was the serpent from the Garden of Eden. And Satan delighted in humiliating us and mistreating us. He looked for various ways to rub our noses in his victory and in our defeat. And as ages passed and sin increased, men would get down on all fours and worship false gods, demeaning and degrading themselves with the sin of idolatry, while Satan climbed up his high horse and became an object of worship in various temples throughout the world. From the heights of nobility, men had now plummeted to the depths of almost total depravity. It seemed that no sin was off limits as the children of Adam practiced the most revolting vices. Oh, how we needed deliverance. 
how desperate were we for a Savior, for one who was not subject, not under the foot of the serpent. How we needed a second Adam and a second Eve to defeat the serpent in a second battle. And men were right in thinking that this deliverance would come. For the good Lord had promised this deliverance immediately after the fall of Adam. The devil may have stripped our first parents of grace, and yes, humiliated them by lording it over them, but Adam and Eve and their future children still had hope. Hope that the tables would turn. Hope that the fate of being crushed under the heel of Satan would eventually be reversed with two of our own, two children of Adam and Eve who would crush the head of the serpent under their heels. The promise of deliverance can be found in the historical book of Genesis, chapter 3, verse 15 to be exact. Some scripture scholars call this passage from Genesis the first gospel, the proto-evangelium, the first announcement of good tidings of victory to come. In other words, the gospel of Christ, at least in seed form, begins to be preached immediately after the fall of Adam. The setting is the Garden of Eden. And three culprits are lined up before the good Lord, who addresses each of them in turn, beginning with Adam, ending with the serpent. And after various curses and maledictions were aimed at Adam and Eve and the serpent, the Most High God ends with a note of hope and future blessing. And we know this line from Scripture so very well. And God said, I will put enmity, an enemy relationship between you, serpent, and the woman, and between your seed, your offspring, serpent, and the woman's seed. She shall crush your head, and you shall bruise his heel, unquote. Now, St. Jerome, the greatest of all scripture scholars, clearly translates the scripture passage I just quoted using the Latin term ipsa, as in she, ipsa, she shall crush your head. The wonderful Dewey Reams Bible, which is an English translation of the traditional Latin Vulgate, uses Jerome's translation and that of many other church fathers, namely, she shall crush your head. And furthermore, traditional liturgical hymns and antiphons repeat this notion that Ipsa, she, the woman, prophesied in Genesis, the new Eve, the blessed virgin, will crush will stand atop of and will humiliate the devil. For 4,000 years, Lucifer had had his foot over us. But with the great mystery of the Immaculate Conception, with Our Lady being created in the order of redemption from the moment of her conception, from her being saved by Christ in an extraordinary way, being preserved from sin as opposed to being cleansed from sin, from the moment of her conception then, she, Ipsa, put her heel squarely upon the head of the serpent and she crushed it. And this makes Catholic common sense because it is impossible to imagine that she who was destined, predestined to crush the head of the serpent would first be crushed by him. Impossible to think that. Mary stomping on the head of the snake is the fulfillment of the prophecy of Genesis. But this fulfillment found in Our Lady is also seen and prefigured in various women in the Old Testament. You see, it is amazing when we read the Old Testament how often the Jews of old were saved from their enemies due to the courageous acts of women who literally would crush the heads of various foes. From the book of Judges, for example, in the Old Testament. In the book of Judges, there is recorded the story of a woman named Jael, a foe of the Jews, an enemy of God's people. A bloodthirsty general was looking for a place to hide. Jael invited him into her tent and gave him a glass of warm milk to help him sleep. Jael 
soon took a tent stake and placed its point on the temple of the head of the enemy of the Jews. She then raised a hammer and with all her might struck that stake through his head, thus impaling him to the ground. The enemy's head was crushed and Israel was saved. And consider the wondrous biblical story of Judith, that holy and chaste widow who stood up to the evil general Holofernes, who had threatened to exterminate all the Jews. Dressed in her most beautiful garments and smelling of the most sweet perfume, Judith entered into the tent of the enemy general Holofernes. He was enraptured by her beauty. The enemy let down his guard. He got drunk and he passed out. Well, Holofernes never woke up. For Judith literally beheaded him and brought back the proof in a bag. And seeing the contents of the bag, the Jews shouted in triumph while the leaderless enemy army fled in confusion and shame. That is why Judith was called by the Jews the highest honor of our race. And I could also mention to you the beautiful Queen Esther in Scripture as well, who saved her people by defeating the enemies of the Jews. These prophecies, these prefigurements have been fulfilled, they will be fulfilled, and they are still being fulfilled. In Mexico, for example, the Blessed Mother came to St. Juan Diego and left that miraculous image upon his tilma or shirt. The icon of Our Lady Guadalupe shows the Virgin clothed in a beautiful starry mantle. And furthermore, the miraculous image shows her standing atop of the black moon, the very symbol of the serpent god, literally, that was worshipped by the pagan Aztecs. Once again, we see Our Lady's foot atop of the snake. But Our Lady's heel will one day fully crush the head of the serpent. And that is why the devil fears Our Lady more than he fears God himself in some way. Again, the devil fears our Blessed Mother more than he fears God himself in a way. You see, Satan knows his time is short, and he knows prophecy. He knows that the queen's heel is about to come down. If God directly crushed Satan, the devil could keep his pride, since he lost to the Creator himself. But when the instrument of his demise the one who will have her foot atop of him, is a humble woman, a humble virgin from Nazareth. The devil's humiliation is complete. He will have been beaten and crushed by a human person, by a woman. As Scripture states, Our Lady is terrible and fearsome as an army set in battle array. And she's looking to crush Satan's influence in our lives. You see, because by the power of Christ's holy passion and death, by means of the infinite merits of her divine Son, the Blessed Virgin Mary stands over the devil, not the other way around. It is Christ who ultimately crushed the serpent's head by his victory on Calvary, having stabbed and slain the serpent with the sword of the cross. But as the prophecy from Genesis states, the Son of God and Son of Mary suffered the full onslaught of the devil. He allowed himself, if you will, to be wounded and bruised in his own heel by the serpent, as the prophecy said. And by the power of his passion and death, his blessed mother crushed the serpent's head too. By her holy fiat, by her let it be done to me according to thy word, which brought deliverance to us by her cooperation in the mystery of God becoming flesh, by her rejecting with horror any suggestion of the enemy to commit even the smallest sin or imperfection. But as we ponder just what Christ has accomplished with the cooperation of Our Lady, we, the spiritual children of Jesus and Mary, can come out from under the foot of Satan and stand atop of him by the grace of God. 
As St. Gregory the Great, a wondrous pope of old, once said, we crush the serpent's head when we extirpate from our hearts the beginnings of temptation. And then he lays snares for our heel because he opposes the end of a good action with greater craft and power. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.